Tonight, learn the shocking truth behind the legend and discover the dark secrets hidden for nearly a century at the bottom of the Atlantic. Travel back in time as we unravel mysteries long believed unsolvable. Now, at last, the lies and whitewashes can be exposed and the true story can finally be told. Join us for Titanic Secrets Revealed. Hello, I'm Bernard Hill. I played the captain in the epic movie Titanic. It was a great part, but you know, the more I learned about the Titanic story, the more intriguing it became. When she sank, she left behind a turbulent wake of unanswered questions. For more than 75 years, as she lay in a dark tomb two and a half miles deep in the Atlantic, the mysteries grew around her. But the daring exploration of her wreckage has finally forced the facts to the surface. As if speaking from the grave, Titanic has revealed powerful new physical evidence that is rewriting history. Tonight, we'll tell you the true Titanic story. It's not a love story. It's a sometimes sordid tale of greed, corruption, cover-ups, cowardice, and what some call cold-blooded murder. She was the grandest of all, and a technological triumph over nature, but had unnatural forces doomed her from the start. Eerie omens and premonitions seemed to point to disaster. My father had a very bad dream before we left, but he would never tell my mother what it was. Did the greedy, powerful men in control put a quest for profits above safety, condemning 1,500 passengers to untimely death? The ship was designed to have 64 lifeboats, but they needed to have more luxury and better views, and so they moved it down to 16. And now, the Titanic herself breaks a decades-old silence. Does her wreckage cry proof of criminal negligence or even mass murder? And I saw the ship go and I heard the horrid sounds of people drowning. Were the official investigations nothing but a scandalous mockery? The greatest cover-up of its day? What really sank the ship? Was it a jinx captain who had already wrecked the Titanic's sister ship? Or was it the man who ran the company? who risked safety for glory? Was it new but untried technology? Or was it all a hoax? A giant insurance scam gone awry? They were fully intended to, to sink it. I don't think they actually intended to kill all those people, although they weren't too worried one way or the other. Finally, long-asked questions can now be answered. Our own tests settled the controversy over whether Captain Smith ignored actions which could have saved the day. By leaving the watertight doors open, maybe the ship would have survived longer. This is the Titanic story you haven't heard before. The true story, stripped of the mysteries, deceits, and cover-ups that have shrouded it for decades. This is the story the ship herself tells, as she finally reveals the surprising truth about her deepest, long-guarded secrets. The Titanic captivated the world from the start. In an age of bold new achievements, airplanes, automobiles, skyscrapers, nothing stood out more than the Titanic. She was not only the biggest ship ever built, she was unsinkable. We had tamed the ocean itself, or so we thought. That she would end her one and only voyage as a steel coffin on the bottom of the sea seemed impossible. But in five short days, Her Majesty would end and her mystery would begin. It is April 10, 1912. Wildly cheering crowds have come to witness the departure of the greatest ship ever built. Passengers include not only the famously rich, with names like Astor and Guggenheim, but humble immigrants with dreams of the new world. We decided to sell up everything and go to America, an open hotel in Seattle. The late Edith Heisman was one of the Titanic survivors. Then 15, she saw two-thirds of the passengers she boarded with die, including several on her deck she had befriended. But the Titanic's tragic end never diminished her memory of seeing the great ship for the first time and the awe she felt. I stood there and I looked at that great big ship. She's very high. And I thought, my word, it was a floating palace. It's really the most beautiful ship I've ever seen. 
Titanic was the ultimate in sea travel. She was bigger, set new levels of style, comfort and elegance, and she was invincible. For years we had crossed the ocean in, in all sorts of rickety tickety wooden bathtubs. They went off to, to go from Spain to the New World. They might have a 50-50 chance of getting there, and they were going to have a, a really terrible several months doing it. By the turn of the century, the North Atlantic, once a graveyard of shipwrecks, had evolved dramatically. For cargo ships, it had become a superhighway of shipping lanes. For passenger liners, it was now a racetrack where the world's richest men gambled for glory and fortunes. The competition was fierce, but Bruce Ismay was even fiercer. Bruce Ismay was very desirous as the leader of the White Star Lines and the man who could make a lot of money out of the domination of these sea lines uh, to succeed. With millions at stake, Ismay set in motion dramatic plans to rule the waves. In 1908, an army of Irish laborers began work on his ambitious vision a revolutionary new generation of passenger ships. The biggest, most luxurious liners ever conceived, they'd be the weapon he needed to take the lion's share of passage between Europe and America. Within two years, the Olympic was launched, the biggest ship the world had ever seen. But it wasn't enough. Ismay wanted more. The shipyard now turned to building the vessel that would give it to him, the Titanic. It was very much a labor-intensive job. When you see the standards of workmanship, we always wondered how on earth they managed with the facilities, the limited facilities that they had compared with what we use nowadays. 14,000 men worked night and day to ready the ship for launch. By then, its fame had already grown so great that 100,000 people gathered to watch as it slid gracefully into the water. Among them was an enthralled young boy who later became a motion picture producer and turned his memories into the movie A Night to Remember. I was a little boy, six years old, and I looked up from the platform, this enormous ship way up above me, and then suddenly it started to slide away into the sea, and I felt that I was sliding backwards instead of a ship. I never forgot it. An extraordinary impression on me. Everything about the Titanic was wondrous, starting with her size. She was almost 900 feet long, about four city blocks, 220 feet high. Just one of her anchors weighed 15 tons. A fortune was spent on her posh and elegant interior though some think that money might have been better spent elsewhere. Legend is that they spared no expense. They did. The fact that she had the triple screw made her clumsy and less maneuverable. Smaller, faster liners of the day use four propellers or screws. But Titanic, in what was thought to be a technological advance, was built with a new three propeller configuration. Unfortunately, this new technology had a hidden flaw, which would prove to play a major role in the Titanic's disaster. It made the massive ship hard to stop and slow to turn. But to adoring passengers like the young Eva Hart, the ship was magnificent. I can see the Titanic if I close my eyes very clearly. For the late Eva Hart, like hundreds of others, fate, in the form of a labor dispute, was to change forever the course of her life. We were booked in a ship called the Philadelphia. And there was a coal strike and she didn't sail. And we were transferred to the Titanic, which everyone thought was a wonderful piece of luck. It wasn't luck. It was a brilliant coup by Bruce Ismay. As the coal strike began shutting down competing liners, Ismay called his fleet into port and bet everything on one ship, his new Titanic. There was a real shortage of coal and a number of steamships were docked and their passengers were transferred to the Titanic and also their coal. Now to reach America, there was only one ticket, one ship with enough coal to make it. And bookings were brisk. There were 
were a lot of famous people on board, some very, very wealthy people. The first class passenger list was a roll call of the rich and famous. The Titanic's lavish upper decks were the place to be seen, a playground for the powerful who weren't above some scandalous behavior. Millionaire mining czar Benjamin Guggenheim flaunted his mistress on the way home to his wife. The wealthiest passenger, John Jacob Astor, was traveling with his pregnant 19-year-old bride. Astor also brought along a friend, Margaret Molly Brown, a brash Denver gold millionaireess who was fighting her way up the social ladder. She hadn't sought out going aboard the Titanic. Um, it was just the ship that was available, and her friends, the Astors, said, oh, come along, it's going to be lots of fun. I guess anybody who was anybody was going to go on that ship. But far below the elite first-class deck, way down by the cargo holds, the melting pot was steaming. More than half of the Titanic's passengers were housed in third class, in the crowded quarters known as steerage. Third class was the dirty little secret of the passenger trade. Mostly immigrants, they were barred from the first and second class decks, out of sight, out of mind. But more than half the profits came from steerage. Steerage was pretty much the bread and butter for the White Star Line, the third class passengers, because you've got you know, the most number of people taking up the least amount of space. It's very important to everybody to realize that the Titanic was truly a floating Ellis Island. A ticket to a new life? Only $35, about $650 today. A startling contrast to first-class fares of $3,300, or $60,000 in modern currency. American millionaire George Vanderbilt and his wife could easily afford the tickets, but they canceled by telephone the day before departure, after his mother had bad feelings about the trip. What people claimed were omens or premonitions of doom had dogged the Titanic from the start. In the Irish shipyard during construction, the Catholic workers whispered in dismay about the identity number on Titanic's massive hull. 406063. Its upside-down reflection on the water looked like the words, No Pope. Was the ship unholy? At least one passenger boarding on departure day sensed an ill destiny. I knew that there was just something in the air about it, but my mother was so terribly upset. Though very young then, Eva Hart would always remember her mother's sense of dread and how her father tried to reassure her. He put his arm around her shoulders, and I can see this quite clearly. And he said, no, my dear, this is a ship that is unsinkable. And she said, well, that is flying in the face of God, and that's why I'm frightened. The most astonishing premonition of all is a novel, which seems to forewarn of the disaster, 10 years before the Titanic was even built. It's called Futility, written in 1898 by Morgan Robertson. In it, a colossal new ship named the Titan is on its maiden voyage from England to New York in April, when it strikes an iceberg and sinks in almost the exact spot where the Titanic would go down 14 years later. The Titan's dimensions, top speed, number of lifeboats and passengers aboard are strikingly identical to the Titanic's. Futility even predicts correctly which side of the ship the iceberg will strike. When we come back, prelude to the great ship's disaster. The fatal voyage begins with fire and ends with ice. On Titanic, secrets revealed. High noon, departure time. The Titanic steamed away as tens of thousands gaily cheered her on, unaware of the near disaster they were about to witness. The ship's captain, Edward J. Smith, playing to the approving audience, ordered up more power from the engine room. Too much power, many believe. The Titanic tore through the harbor, creating a dangerous suction from her mammoth propellers. Only minutes into her maiden voyage and Captain Smith had already put her in peril. A docked liner, the New York, was sucked in by the Titanic's wake. The mooring line snapped like kite string, and she was immediately drawn into a crash course with the Titanic. 
Edith Heisman and her father watched in horror. It looked as if the New York was going to run into the Titanic. And my father turned around and said, that's a bad omen. At the last possible moment, the engines of the Titanic blew a surge of water that pushed the New York away, narrowly avoiding an embarrassing and costly collision. Smith's boss, Bruce Ismay, was not amused. This was more than just a close call. It was an ominous case of deja vu. Only seven months earlier, in a similar incident, the Titanic's sister ship, Olympic, had collided with a British Navy cruiser, the HMS Hawk causing massive damage to both ships. Found at fault by a government inquiry, Captain Smith. Yet Ismay still put him at the helm of the Titanic. Smith certainly looked right for the role. He looked like Noah to me. He had a white beard and an extremely uh, good reputation with both the company and with his officers and crew. Passengers liked him very much. He seemed to fulfill all the august presence that the role of a captain demanded on the North Atlantic. This was to be Smith's final voyage before he retired, and he was hoping for a smooth trip. But below decks, deep in the belly of the great ship, the fuse of a powder keg had already been lit in coal bunker number five. Some spark occurred, whatever, coal rubbing against itself and just some spontaneous combustion and it began smoldering and it was discovered about the time the ship sailed and it may have been smoldering for days at that point, uh, we don't really know. It took stokers three back-breaking days to empty the bulkhead and put the fire out. Captain Smith ordered the ship designer, Thomas Andrews, to inspect the damage. He feared the intense heat might have weakened the steel and compromised the watertight bulkheads. No one but the crew knew of a fire on board. Strolling passengers enjoyed the voyage of their lives. Love was in bloom. As the sun sank for the last time on the great ship, the passengers indulged themselves in the opulent dining rooms. One topic of discussion was the sudden and sharp drop in temperature. As the adults retired to the vices of expensive alcohol and tobacco, families put in for the night. In Eva Hart's cabin, Eva's mother was still unable to shake her ill feelings about the trip. At 10 p.m., Crow's Nest lookouts Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee came on watch under miserable conditions. It was a dark, moonless night, and the ocean was absolutely still, making details on the horizon difficult to see. The temperature had fallen to 31 degrees, but it was worse up in the Crow's Nest, where the men struggled to see with a wind chill that made it nearly zero degrees. After forwarding to the bridge the first radio warnings of ice, the Marconi wireless operators came within range of the mainland. Now swamped by passenger messages, they're paying customers. They hardly notice when more transmissions warned them of ice dead ahead. Many of the messages never made it to the bridge. Captain Smith hands one ice warning to his boss, Bruce Ismay. Then, unexpectedly, Titanic extends her southwesterly course and increases speed. Why? Who was really in charge, Smith or Ismay? Was he, in fact, a kind of super captain? Was he egging on Commodore Smith? Who was in control when the ship approached the ice fields at a dangerously high speed? One survivor put the blame squarely on Ismay. The witness heard him telling Captain Smith that he wanted the ship to make a faster crossing than the Olympic, her sister ship, had made the previous year on her maiden voyage. He wanted each of these ships to be better than the last. Titanic never had a chance to beat the Olympics record. She would not survive the night. It may be that too much was being asked of Captain Smith. Was it his job to get passengers safely to New York? 
or to generate publicity for Ismay and White Star. The claim that Titanic was unsinkable wasn't just a publicity ploy. The ship had a revolutionary design. The lower levels were partitioned into watertight compartments, as you can see here on our precise scale model. If one of them was punctured, the water would only fill that compartment. It wouldn't flood the entire ship and sink it. It's a great idea, in theory. The flaw is that if enough compartments were punctured, the ship will still sink. 11.30, Sunday night, April 14th. Most of the ship had retired for the evening. Passengers Edith Heisman and Eva Hart were sleeping. In the smoking lounge, a card game simmered. In the Marconi room, communications with the mainland continued non-stop, while ice warnings from other ships remained undelivered to the bridge. Lookouts Fleet and Lee were struggling to see anything on the dark and bitterly cold night. At the helm, Officer Murdoch had his orders. He was to hold the Titanic speed at a breakneck 22 and a half knots in water so perilous that some other ships had stopped for the night. Eleven thirty-seven. Lookout Frederick Fleet sees something looming out of the night. It's an iceberg. First Officer Murdoch wasted no time in taking evasive action. He reversed the engines and ordered the rudder to turn hard to port. Unfortunately, the new triple screw configuration combined with an undersized rudder made the ship slow to turn without forward power. The crew watched in horror as the starboard side of the ship scraped the iceberg with the massive power of its own momentum. Edith Heisman, like most of the Titanic's 1,300 passengers, hardly noticed the bump in the night. My father went up on deck and they to see what was going on. And he says, oh, it's nothing much. They only struck an iceberg, he said. Within moments, Captain Smith was on the bridge and attempted emergency action. Exactly what remains a mystery. Smith tried maneuvering his vessel, and we don't know what he did. Was he trying to pull backwards to, to lessen the amount of water coming in? Was he trying to re-maneuver in some way? It's not clear what he was up to. Smith again called for ship designer Thomas Andrews to assess the damage. Andrews went below and toured the flooding compartments. To understand what he saw, we've used a clear model of the Titanic. The iceberg compromised the hull over a 200-foot stretch below the waterline. Five of the forward watertight compartments were taking on water, including boiler room five, already damaged by the coal fire. Sea water was rushing into the ship at an astonishing 400 tons per minute. Before the clock hit midnight, people on the lower decks in the forward section were already dead or drowning. Andrews told Smith that the ship would be on the ocean floor in an hour and a half. And because of a decision based on profits over safety, they had only enough lifeboats to save less than half of those on board. The ship was designed to have 64 lifeboats but they needed to have more passengers and more luxury and better views, and so they moved it down to 16. And then, with a lot of arguing, they decided to put four collapsibles back aboard. Ismay's dream was crumbling. 2,200 people had been snared by his vanity and greed. Just after midnight, disbelieving first-class passengers were awakened and told to don their life jackets and report to the boat deck. Many still doubted they were in actual danger. 12.10, Captain Smith told the wireless operators to send out a distress signal to all ships. The Frankfurt, a passing German tanker, responded first. But the Frankfurt used a competing wireless system, and the Titanic's operators, who still didn't believe their ship was going down, weren't going to ask for help from competitors. The German operator got back from Titanic's wireless operator. YAAF, which was code for 
You are a fool. Keep out. 1225. The ship had less than two hours left. In a bitter irony, the first lifeboats were launched at the insistence of Bruce Ismay. 1245. The wireless operators finally heard from a friendly ship, the Carpathia, which used the Marconi system. She was 58 miles away, and it would take her four hours to reach them. The Titanic would be lost by then. But other help appeared to be closer at hand. I was standing on deck speaking to my father. I turned around and I said to him, look at the lights over there. It's another ship. Next minute, the lights are out. Several crewmen also saw the ship. Captain Smith ordered white flares fired every five minutes. The other ship in the area was the Californian. Her captain, Stanley Lord, had cut his engines because of treacherous ice fields. Lord's radio man had also shut down for the night. The Californian could see a ship that apparently was sending up rockets, but in their mind, the ship was steaming away from them. The white signal at sea can literally mean keep away from me. I can't maneuver out of your way. And in fact, seamanship manuals specifically said to a watch officer, if you don't understand the signal, it's best to keep clear of the ship. Lord told his crewmen to keep an eye on the ship, and he retired to his cabin. There were lights on, and music playing, and people around. But my father made a straight for a lifeboat and said, now stay here, don't let anybody move you. Edith's father acted instinctively. Most passengers had no idea of the urgency of the moment, unless they were unlucky enough to be down on the lower decks. Hundreds of immigrants housed in the lower levels up front scrambled to escape the flooding. But the iron gates that prevented them from rubbing elbows with the other classes had them in a death trap. Among the frantic steerage passengers are Minnie Kutz and her two children. Basically, she ended up lost and at, at a locked door and couldn't find her way up to the boat deck at all. But Minnie had an advantage. She spoke English. Hundreds in third class did not. She grabbed the first crewman she could find. He was able to not only direct her how to get up to the boat deck, but um, found a life jacket for her and I think even gave her his own and told her, well, there, now you will remember me. She never saw the crewman again. Next, the final countdown. For Titanic, the maiden voyage was ending. For her passengers, the terror had just begun. To believe that this was serious. It was, after all, the unsinkable Titanic. But once they did, they quickly realized their problem wasn't being on the sinking ship. It was how to get off. Just over 1,100 lifeboat seats for more than 2,200 people. First-class women and children were given priority, and women and children of all classes went before men. During the chaos, many people would be separated from their loved ones. My father turned around and said to me, he took us there, he was smoking a cigar, and he said, I'll see you, see you in New York, he told my mother. We never saw him again. By the time most of the lifeboats were in the water, those left on board now knew for certain where the Titanic was taking them, and it wasn't to the new world. Suddenly, Titanic's bow nosedived further into the sea. It's believed Bulkhead 5, damaged by the coal fire, had given way. There were only four lifeboats left, and more than 1,600 people still on board. Panic set in. It incited a kind of mob reaction, and Officer Lowe drew his weapon and fired it into the air twice. He just fired his gun along the side of the ship in an effort to frighten them, just to show them that he meant business. The line between desperation and cowardice began to blur. There was certainly one uh, confirmed case of somebody dressed up as a woman to try and get away as, as a woman. Babies became tickets to salvation, as at least one mother would testify. Someone took him, just, you know, virtually grabbed him out of her arms and was off in the crowd. 
Maybe that person expected to use this baby to get access to a lifeboat or something, or even access to the boat deck. She never knew. 2 a.m. The ship would be gone in 20 minutes. A stern began rising out of the water as the forward A deck sank below, sending 33,000 tons of water crashing into the ship. Amid the screams of terror and panic came the calm reassurance of a hymn played by the ship's musicians, whose lives could now be measured in minutes. They were playing all the time. Well, to make people feel happy, I suppose. On the boat deck, the two egos responsible for what was happening met one last time, then took divergent paths on that day and in history. Never the opportunist, Bruce's may grabbed an empty crewman's seat on one of the last two lifeboats. Smith stayed with his ship and the 1,500 people soon to die with him. 2.15 a.m., the Titanic's bow was deep in the water, forcing her stern into the air. The passengers on deck clung to the ship as the decks listed more than 80 degrees. The stern of the Titanic became a perch for over a thousand unfortunate souls. The ship had been sinking for two hours and 35 minutes, but now the end was near. 2.17, lights out. The mighty and glorious Titanic went ever deeper into the water, forcefully ripped in half, and on the torturous final leg of her maiden voyage. As she got down to the boilers, there was a terrible explosion, and the screams of the people was terrible. One man had readied himself at the end the only way he knew how, the ship's baker, Charles Joffin. He consumed an entire bottle of whiskey. Then he clambered up the deck wearing his life jacket as the decks were sloping and he reached the stern. He sat on the poop railing with his arm around the flagstaff. And as the ship went down, he rode it down like an elevator and reached the water and stepped off. His head didn't even get wet. The alcohol kept him alive until he was pulled into a boat. Most in the water were not so lucky. Max Stone Graham recounts the story of two men who shared a deck chair in the North Atlantic. One would live, one would not. The passenger who was in extremes near the end of his life, obviously, felt compelled to fill the moments with some sort of comment or conversation. And what he said was, what a night. What a night. And then the man drifted away. Many looked death in the face quite courageously. Benjamin Guggenheim and his butler changed from life jackets to formal evening clothes and said that at least they'd go out like gentlemen. I didn't close my eyes. I just was utterly fascinated. I watched every moment and I saw the ship go and I heard the horrid sounds of people drowning, which is just the worst sound you can imagine. For Eva Hart, it was the beginning of a nightmare that would haunt her her entire life. Considered one of the lucky ones, Eva Hart and 705 other survivors were forced to listen as more than 1,500 people slowly died in the icy waters. Across the water that night was this awful sound of 1,500 people freezing and dying in the waters. It was somebody compared it to the sound of locusts on a summer night. Those cries haunted Bruce Ismay until the last day of his life too. As he sat in a tiny lifeboat in the North Atlantic, his ship, his dream had been taken by the sea. While Ismay sat locked in his own self-made hell, others rose to their finest hour. Molly Brown led by example. She took the oars. She had women take shifts rowing to keep themselves warm because it was so cold that night and just keeping the spirits up on the boat. 
she was haunted by those less fortunate, the women of steerage class who had to watch their men die. She thought it was actually very unfair to many of these third class passengers to lose their primary breadwinner because there were just very, very few third class men who survived. But those that got seats in the lifeboats didn't exactly have peace of mind. What's help coming? And when? And what if one of these boats overturned? And a seat in a lifeboat did not guarantee survival. Three men climbed out of the icy water into one of Titanic's collapsible rafts. But they'd been in the freezing water too long and died during the night from exposure. The raft would drift 200 miles before their bodies were discovered one month later. The sea was very mild, but very, very cold. And all you could see when daylight was coming, just this big iceberg, that's all. You'd never believe it was a, a, a boat there. In the early morning light, the survivors found themselves surrounded by icebergs. They'd spent the night trying to row away from the hundreds of floating bodies. The Carpathia arrived by dawn. Molly Brown ordered rowers on her lifeboat to make for the ship. When one crewman argued that the dead should be picked up first, Molly threatened to throw him overboard. It was amazing that my great-grandmother had so much calm and composure during the rescue efforts. But she was traveling alone and didn't have to worry like so many of the people on the rescue ship who were really consumed for the first five or six hours with just finding their loved ones. In the chaos and confusion of the night, most children were separated from their mothers. Eva Hart remembered being lifted into the Carpathia in a cargo net. They were let down and the cargo then was children. And you couldn't put them in the, in the nets without they were in something because our little legs and feet would have gone through the mesh because the mesh is quite huge. And that was the terrifying thing, to be swung above the ocean. I, I was absolutely terrified. As for the woman whose baby was ripped from her arms during the evacuation, while despondent and grieving on board Carpathia, she heard a child screaming. The voice was her son's. She hears him crying and she recognizes the cries, but this person won't give him back to her. They even got the captain involved. He proved that he was her son because she could identify a birthmark that he had. And of course, when they peeled off his shirt or whatever, there it was. But losses far outnumbered reunions. Edmund and Michael Navatil, ages two and three, had been kidnapped by their father from their mother, who had custody. He boarded Titanic under the assumed name Hoffman. He put his sons, handed them over to the people in the lifeboat and said, please take care of my boys. And he went on to his death. The kids arrived in New York City and no one was there to meet these Hoffman children. No one knew who they were and they became known as the orphans of the Titanic. The boys were eventually identified and returned to their mother in France. More than 80 years later, the eldest son discovered his father's grave in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He put his hand on his father's gravestone and he looked back almost ashen-faced and in French said, you know, I remember. As a child, my father used to sing a lullaby, a Chopin etude to my brother and I every night before we went to bed. And when I put my hand on my father's gravestone, I can hear the angels singing that same lullaby. Next up, a shocked world cries out in sorrow and rage, beginning decades of heated debate. So third-class passengers were kept below decks. No doubt about that. Titanic's carnage shocked the world. It was not only the greatest loss of life in maritime history, but many of its victims were famous. It was as if a plane full of Hollywood stars had crashed today. And the biggest question was, who was to blame? But the answer was lost in a haze of politics and the evidence now lay at the bottom of the sea. Reports of the sinking reached a stunned and disbelieving public by newspaper the next morning. In cities, electrified crowds jammed the sidewalks, jostling for each new special edition. 
for all people knew, it had just rammed into an iceberg head on and just crippled and people thrown out of their bunks and, and this mad scramble for lifeboats or something. And so there was a great deal of speculation. People didn't realize how dramatic and how slow the whole sinking was. Early accounts that all aboard were safe generated an outpouring of relief. But the mood quickly darkened as news of the astonishing death toll trickled in. Since there would be no eyewitness accounts until the Carpathia arrived in New York with the survivors, the tabloid press went wild. For lack of facts, rumors were rampant, and most of them made their way into the papers. Now all of a sudden you get all these stories about people being shot like dogs on the deck of the Titanic. It was in some ways very typical of journalism of the day, but it was certainly sensational and far from the truth in many, many cases. Yet the truth was sometimes far more macabre than rumor. There were now hundreds of bodies floating in the most heavily traveled sea lane in the world. The grim task of recovering them fell to the McKay Bennett, chartered by White Star. With a hole full of ice, huge stacks of coffins, and a crew of undertakers and embalmers, the death ship began fishing the corpses from the sea. One of the first they found was a two-year-old boy whose body gave up the secrets of how most died. They hadn't drowned. They may have frozen to death or just suffocated because they hadn't been able to breathe. The water was definitely below freezing, and it's like taking a really cold shower. You just don't take a deep breath. And so you never draw air into your lungs. You only draw it into your throat and back out again. More than 300 bodies were found, some so decomposed they were hastily buried at sea. The rest were quickly embalmed and packed in ice. In between corpses, the crew hauled aboard other remains, floating debris from the ship itself, grisly souvenirs of the lost Titanic. They would pick up not only bodies, they would pick up pieces of paneling or deck chairs or things that continued to come gouting up from the wreck. Even on the rescue ship, the hunger for Titanic mementos had begun. On board the Carpathia, people were already screwing the names Titanic off all the lifeboats. While the McKay Bennett saw to the victims, the survivors reached New York. The Carpathia was met by an emotionally charged crowd, split between joyous reunions and woeful grieving. It was only then that the fate of all those aboard was known. Though his 19-year-old bride survived, John Jacob Astor was dead. As was Benjamin Guggenheim, who did indeed go out in style. Also lost were Isidore Strauss, founder of Macy's, and his wife, Ida. As a woman, Ida was offered a seat on a lifeboat, but declined. She said, no, I've stayed with my husband throughout my life, and I'll continue. So she was a very gallant woman who decided to go down with her husband rather than be separated from him. Captain Smith, last seen on the bridge of his dying ship, was dead. He had made no attempt to escape. The captain's death was starkly contrasted by the most notable name to survive, Bruce Ismay. While surviving crewmen like watchman Frederick Fleet and radio operator Harold Bride came home as heroes, Ismay found only hostility. That he survived in place of another was widely seen as an act of cowardice, and he was pounded by the press. He was a ruined man for life. He was ostracized by everybody. And the Americans particularly thought that he was symbolic of the White Star Line's indifference to tragedy by the fact that he had saved his life and so many men were lost. Two official inquiries into the disaster were launched, one in the US, another in England. Rumors of a cover-up began at once. The massive loss of life was quickly blamed on the lack of lifeboats, but White Star deflected blame by showing that, in fact, the Titanic exceeded the number called for by regulations. A shocking disregard for emergency procedures could not be so easily refuted. There was no evacuation plan, and after testimony painted the lifeboat launching as confused, it was learned that Captain Smith had ignored even the most basic safety preparations. The Titanic had never had a lifeboat drill, and so people weren't sure exactly what to do and where to go. So it was very disorganized. In the end, the inquiries were attacked as whitewashes when their final reports acquitted White Star of blame. The British hearing in particular was questionable. 
the Board of Trade, of course, had certified the Titanic as being seaworthy, and then the Board of Trade is the one that conducts the inquiry into our loss. Well, you know, it's the old phrase about putting Dracula in charge of a blood bank. You can't do that. If White Star had been found liable, it would have bankrupted them and been disastrous for the British liner trade, already threatened by German competition. There were reports of witnesses being bribed, and some testimony was simply ignored, such as accounts that the ship broke apart as it sank. The Board of Trade Inquiry of course, didn't want to admit that it broke in two when it went down, and so they made the determination after all these witnesses had said they'd seen the ship break in two, they made the announcement that no, the ship did not break in two. Despite ignoring ice warnings and pushing the Titanic at high speed through dangerous seas, Captain Smith emerged as a courageous hero who went down with his ship. The man scapegoated as the villain was the Californian's Captain Lord, who ironically brought his ship safely home. But Lord was scathingly condemned for disregarding the Titanic's flares. Although called as a witness in the inquiries, he had no opportunity to defend himself. All in all, it was a pretty sorry occasion, but poor Lord lived with that for the rest of his life. The real stain of whitewash became evident when the British inquiry, while clearing White Star of negligence and thereby protecting them from massive liability claims, went on to recommend sweeping safety changes throughout the industry based on the very deficiencies that had led to the Titanic disaster. Among them, enough lifeboats for all, mandatory safety drills, and reduced speed in ice fields. It was small comfort to the families of the victims, but the tragedy did result in some good. I think it heightened the awareness of ship owners and legislators that we can't take anything for granted, that, that we can't call anything unsinkable anymore. The grieving families of the dead received shabby treatment from White Star. More than 600 claims were filed in the US and hundreds more in Britain, but the no-fault findings undermined the claims. The Ryan case, the estate recovered 100 pounds for the death of their son who was a crew member aboard the vessel. He was earning two pounds a week and was the only support of his father. Uh, that represented one full year's salary. Little known at the time, Bruce Ismay, who saved himself, took pains to comfort the family of one who died, Ernest Freeman. He quietly paid for a tombstone and helped Freeman's family financially for a number of years. One survivor did manage to turn tragedy into triumph. Molly Brown, a lifelong social climber and publicity seeker, converted her lifeboat heroism into legend. When she got off the boat and was being um, questioned by all the reporters, and they said, well, how did you survive? And she said, well, simply that she was unsinkable. The name stuck, and the story of the unsinkable Molly Brown became the basis of a hit Broadway musical and movie. In time, the story of the Titanic drifted off the front pages, but never out of memory. For months afterwards, Legions of souvenir hunters scoured Atlantic coast beaches for titanic debris that washed ashore, some of which was crafted into folk art. Well, a beautiful chess table was made by a carpenter out of a piece of wood that was recovered from the Titanic. There's a beautiful picture frame also in this wreckwood art style that is well known all across the Maritimes of Canada. Decades later, fascination with the legendary ship continues to grow. Years of endless conjecture has produced a vast array of myths, controversies, and conspiracy theories, most of which, it seemed at the time, could never be resolved. One of the most fanciful is that the ship that went down wasn't the Titanic, but her sister ship, the Olympic, sunk on purpose as part of a massive insurance scam. The Olympic's collision with the HMS Hawk just months before the Titanic's launch had created serious financial problems for White Star. The Olympic was so badly damaged where the Hawk had crashed into her on the starboard quarter. Quite possibly her back was broken, in which case she was economically a royal. Gardner claims White Star switched the identities of the ships before the Titanic was completed. The Olympic, disguised as the Titanic, was then sunk and an insurance claim collected. The Olympic was scrapped in the 30s 
and Titanic seemed forever lost. So the truth was impossible to find, until now. By the 1980s, we finally conquered the ocean's depths. Titanic had come within our reach. The problem now was, where was she? The Titanic lay at a depth of such crushing pressure. She was long thought to be out of reach forever. But by the 1960s, deep sea exploration was making huge leaps. And within two decades, man had reached depths far beyond Titanic's. It didn't take long for the new technology to be turned to the famous lost ship. Her resting spot was the biggest mystery of all, and finding it would be a difficult and dangerous challenge. But the allure of the great ship and the hope of unmasking the secret she guarded was so powerful it inspired one of the sea's greatest races. It was the Mount Everest of this deep ocean business, and whoever found the Titanic obviously had more of the right stuff than the other people that didn't find the Titanic. The first to take up the challenge was a flamboyant Texas oil millionaire named Jack Grimm, who had already spent fortunes searching for the Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, and Noah's Ark. In 1981, Cadillac Jack, as he was known, opened his wallet again and set off in quest of the sea's holy grail, the wreck of the Titanic. But after two expeditions and millions of dollars, he came up empty. Only later would he find out how close he had been. In 1985, another team entered the race. For 50 days, they towed a robotic video camera along the bottom, but saw nothing. Days away from giving up, a faint image suddenly appeared on the screen. It was indistinct, but something was there. As they maneuvered the camera closer, Ralph White was one of the first to know what they'd found. The first object we saw where we knew we had the Titanic was one of the 27 distinct boilers on the bottom. And within an hour, we had found the major portions of the wreck. The emotion was just unbelievable. After all this time, we had found probably the most famous shipwreck since the Ark. The pictures sent back were mesmerizing. The wreck lit against a backdrop of infinite black was a deep sea apparition of still astounding grace. The ship had been found in a tiny overlooked corner of Jack Grimm's original search quadrant. 12,500 feet deep, about 350 miles off the coast of Newfoundland. As the expedition team watched in fascination, their robotic explorers soon revealed the first of the ship's many secrets. On the night of her demise, she hadn't slid easily into the sea. Confirming eyewitness accounts that the ship broke apart, she was discovered in two massive pieces, almost 2,000 feet apart. This irrefutable new evidence was further proof that the British inquiry's search for truth was questionable. Though tantalizing, the images the expedition captured were limited to portions of the ship at a time, like small, eerie snapshots. The maximum visibility of the Titanic at any one time is 100 feet. So you're only going to see 100 feet of what was an 800-foot object. The job of creating an overview, a complete picture of the ship, was given to artist Ken Marshall whose detailed illustrations slid the individual pieces into place. Nobody had ever seen the whole wreck. So what I did was to look at these literally thousands of images that were brought back from the 1985 and 86 expedition and then interpret them and create an overall view of how the entire bow section and how the entire stern section of the Titanic looked. What emerged were haunting portraits of the great ship in death spectral reminders of how magnificent she was in life. Two years after the 1985 expedition, a French and American team set out with a daring new mission, to see the ship themselves. They also hoped to retrieve Titanic artifacts from the ocean floor, and to make the first dangerous probe into the interior of the wreck. 
Months of intensive planning went into what would be a deep sea mission, every bit as technologically sophisticated and potentially life-threatening as landing on the moon. Going to sea, let alone diving the Titanic, is a major undertaking. It would take us almost a year to put together the necessary equipment to guarantee its success. The entire mission hinged on the Nortil, a $20 million submersible in which a crew of three would descend through the two and a half miles of pitch black sea that enveloped the wreck below. It would be a two and a half hour journey and as the Nortil descended, the weight of the water above would create pressures of such intensity that even a microscopic leak in its titanium hull would literally vaporize the crew. If something were to go wrong down there, we are not talking minutes, we're not talking seconds, we are talking milliseconds. On the surface, the command center stayed in constant communication as they monitored the Nortil's descent. But on this trip, something went terribly wrong. At 450 feet, the entire control panel erupted with warning lights. The Nortil had lost much of its power, and help was a long way away. As if she had not already taken enough lives, Titanic threatens to claim even more. The crew of the submersible Nortil, on their way to explore the wreck, now faces a life-threatening emergency at 450 feet, well beyond the reach of help from above. Though the Nortil's crew had rehearsed scenarios like this countless times, this was no drill. Their batteries had failed, and they were losing power rapidly. Their only option was to abort the mission and make an emergency resurfacing. They slowly made the ascent, finally reaching the welcome safety of the mother ship. No lives would be claimed that day. It took three tense days topside to isolate and repair the problem. After tests and more tests, the Nortil was relaunched. At 12,500 feet, the Nortil reached the sea floor. The crew powered up its thrusters and turned on its lights for the first time. As they cautiously edged towards where the still the hidden ship should be, they anxiously peered into the darkness ahead. I remember looking through the port into total blackness, and then all of a sudden, um, shadows started to take shape, and there was form in the blackness, and we came up right on the bow of the Titanic, the classic shot of the Titanic. It was a powerful moment. Theirs were the first eyes to take in the Titanic in 75 years. But as the lights swept the wreckage, they made an astonishing discovery, one that only added to the mysteries. When we discovered the wreck of the Titanic, one of the things that we noticed was a hole in the starboard side. The gaping 30-foot hole was high above the iceberg's reach. If the ship's collision with the iceberg didn't tear open this hole, what did? Had there been an explosion after impact, as some believed? One of the legends of the, the Titanic is that it had a, there was a fire that was smoldering in a coal bunker, and that running into the iceberg just made that worse, and that this really caused the, the problem. But with first-hand investigation, the explosion theory, like so many others, was soon put to rest. In further investigation, this hole was found to be a structural crack that occurred when the bow impacted the bottom and the ship kind of flexed. This was a weak part of the ship and it pulled the hull out and opened up this hole. Though the crew wanted to explore deeper into the Titanic, they could not do it themselves. Penetrating the hull of the Titanic itself is far too dangerous to uh, let a manned submersible crew do. So once again, a robotic explorer would have to become their seeing eye. 
the Nautil was outfitted with a remote operated vehicle, or ROV. Small and highly maneuverable, the ROV could slip through narrow spaces the Nautil could not. Remotely controlled by the crew through an umbilical cord, the ROV fed back pictures from a specially designed camera. Their high-tech explorer slowly took them into the very heart of the ship, into a lost world, unseen since the Titanic's plunge below the waves. The crew sat spellbound as the ROV glided down the ship's grand staircase. Once a promenade for the richest and most powerful people of the day. The inside, while still damaged, was not damaged as much as everybody thought it was. There were still paint on wood. A lot of the things on the inside are in remarkable state of preservation as compared to the same items on the outside of the ship. As they traveled ever deeper into the vast interior of the submerged ship, each turn of the underwater camera added new information to the Titanic's true story. Eyewitness accounts by a number of survivors claimed that third-class passengers were prevented from reaching the lifeboats as the Titanic sank, and that some were locked below decks, virtual prisoners doomed to drown. So third-class passengers were kept below decks, no doubt about that. I mean, we've got an officer that was guarding a passageway. His orders are to guard the passage, stop third-class passengers getting on deck. Though the claims had been denied, the ROV was about to lay bare the dark truth. It found the crucial iron gates still locked. The passengers behind these bars had been condemned to death. This would have been the easiest evacuation route for the third-class serious passengers to make it to the boat deck. The only other escape route for the desperate steerage passengers would have been through the nearby number two cargo hold. But the Nautil's roving electronic eye had yet another terrible revelation. The number two cargo hold was also sealed shut by iron bars. With no escape available, hundreds of third-class passengers were already dead as others on the upper levels reached the lifeboats. All three lower steerage decks in the forward section of the ship were completely filled with water before the first lifeboat was even lowered. As the exploration of the interior continued, the ROV was guided down through a broken skylight into what had been the Marconi room. Yeah, what's that? With its now what's disintegrating that? equipment, it, yeah. this was the site where ice warnings went unheeded and the first yeah. offer of assistance was ignored. Yeah. But the biggest secret about the Titanic's disastrous death was still not known. What were the wounds that sank the unsinkable ship? It had always been assumed that the injuries that did her in were massive. But when the Nautil's crew tried to inspect the damage, it was concealed. That part of the hull was buried out of reach in 60 feet of mud. It took sonar imaging finally to reveal the surprising truth. The extent of actual damage was minimal, dispelling the Board of Inquiry's findings of massive ruptures. The expedition finally determined that the Titanic didn't sink as a result of a long 300-foot gash, but it was several small holes that were punched along as the iceberg bounced along the side of the ship. As the Titanic scraped the iceberg, a number of the hull's steel plates buckled, popping rivets that opened more plates along her side. They were small tears, but they were just too many, spanning too great a distance for the ship to stay afloat. There was still a final question to answer, and the Nautil next moved half a mile away to inspect the wreckage of the stern. The crew was looking to resolve the most outrageous of all Titanic myths, that the identities of the Olympic and Titanic had been switched in a mammoth insurance fraud. As they cautiously navigated the Nautil toward the ship's giant propeller, the truth was finally revealed.
The number 401 was the Titanic's official identification number, proof positive that it was not the Olympic that went down that April night in 1912. Another myth shattered, another secret revealed. But the Nortiel has come for more than just secrets. She's come for sunken treasure, priceless titanic relics thrown from the ship during its violent descent. Coming up, the submersible crew struggles to pick up delicate artifacts. Later, we piece together clues about the lost lives and lost loves of the Titanic's passengers. Strewn in a wide swath around the Titanic are thousands of artifacts, personal belongings, furniture, china from the dining rooms, Nortiel would try to collect them and take them to the surface. Nothing like it had ever been done at that depth, and it will be one of the most complicated and dangerous salvage jobs in history. The entire floor of the Atlantic is raked by a patchwork of mountains and valleys. But as fortune would have it, the Titanic sank in an unusually flat area. As she plunged into the abyss, she expelled huge clouds of debris that followed her down and now lie spread out around her in a two square mile area. It was basically like sitting on a Kmart parking lot. The bow was upright and you have the debris field. You've got uh, the baggage, and you've got the bedding, and you've got the, the cook pots and the wine bottles. Uh, something that puts that very huge ship on a very human scale. To recover the Titanic's long lost treasures, the Nortil used two highly sophisticated hydraulic arms. They were so flexible and surprisingly maneuverable, almost nothing is beyond their grasp. The most difficult thing that a submersible crew member has to learn and master is the control of one of these mammoth hydraulic arms. We can pick up an egg or we can crush a piece of steel. That's how powerful they are or how gentle they are. The crew first charted the expansive debris field, examining and cataloging even the tiniest artifacts. When we were doing the artifact recovery, the most important thing was the selection of the artifact. We have to figure out if we can recover it with any marginal degree of safety. Each one had a unique way of recovery, but the most important thing was to recover it without damage. Finally, they began to collect the selected pieces. It was a slow, painstaking process, sometimes taking several hours to retrieve just one artifact. But even the most fragile items were recovered like this delicate plate, picked up with a small suction cup attached to one of the arms. Once lifted, the plate was gently moved into a recovery basket, which protected it from powerful currents that could tear it loose on the journey back to the surface. But the arms were also powerful enough to grapple with brawnier objects as well. To lift heavy pieces to the surface, the hydraulic arms attach steel cables to it. The cables were then secured to large flotation bags filled with diesel fuel. Once everything was in place, the bags were cut loose. Since diesel fuel is lighter than water, the bags rose to the surface, where they were recovered by divers from the ship above. When brought to the surface, this innocent-looking piece of mechanical equipment would lead to renewed speculation about Captain Smith's final orders to his engine room. One of the more interesting things that we found um, in exploring the wreck of the Titanic is we recovered quite a few engine telegraphs. This is the instrument that's used from the bridge to relay the engine settings to the engine room. Of the ones that were recovered and the ones that we have seen still on the bottom, one unique phenomenon. We know from the testimony of the officers on the bridge that they put the engine telegraph into all stop. But the return from the engine room was slow ahead. Was the discrepancy mechanical failure? Were the men in the engine room already dead when the order arrived? 
or running for their lives? Was Captain Smith trying to outmaneuver disaster? The answers are not yet known, but perhaps as more clues are brought to the light of day, the explanation will emerge. Almost 5,000 separate items have been taken back from the sea. Individually, they may not say much, but like words in a sentence, when put together in the right order, they sometimes tell spellbinding stories. Woven into Titanic's cloak of dark mysteries are the loose threads of the dead. While some of the victims were famous, most were not. And for years, little was known about many of them. But now, with the recovery of thousands of personal effects, some of the lost stories of the dead will never be forgotten again. From the primordial expanse of the lifeless ocean floor, one of the Nortil's robotic arms seized a tiny, unknown object, no bigger than a playing card. Grab it from the other side, Max. Like the other relics here, it seemed a miracle that it had withstood the corrosive forces of time and sea. Maybe with the shovel is better. What do you think, the age? No. No, no, no. I think it's good with no. it. But it was at the surface that the fragile object faced the most serious danger. After 75 years at uh, 4,000 meters below, it's quite fantastic, isn't it? In some cases, exposure to the air alone can trigger instant deterioration and a priceless piece of history might be lost forever. This would have been a great loss. The tiny item is only a simple leather wallet, but it's part of an heroic story about the courageous act of the man whose identity the wallet still holds. When one of the boats became tangled and Captain Smith desperately said, is there anyone that knows anything about seamanship? Major Pushoff put up his hand and said, I'm a yachtsman, I might be able to help you. In a moment, a hero was born. The Major, a middle-aged passenger, volunteered to risk his life in order to save others. He said, I want you to crawl down this rope because it's tangled and that lifeboat is going to tip over with those women and children if we don't untangle the bind and the ropes going down. And when he did, the boat settled very abruptly down into the ocean. Thanks to the Major's selfless bravery, the lines were untangled and all aboard survived the night, including the Major, who, while tumbling into the boat, saw his wallet go tumbling into the sea. Who could have dreamed it would one day be recovered? But not only did the Major's wallet survive nearly a century in the harsh underwater environment, miraculously, so did its contents. In the business cards that you see here were all intact after that time at the bottom. How is it possible that leather, paper, and other delicate items spread around the seafloor have survived at all? Ironically, the answer is found in the water. At that depth, two pervasive elements of corrosion are lacking, light and oxygen. In that ghostly place, time seems to stand still. Some of the personal belongings brought up from the past reveal forgotten stories of love and loss. I've watched people stand and cry in front of some of these objects. One of them is a bracelet with the name Amy engraved in diamonds. Was Amy a granddaughter and a grandparent was bringing that gift home? Was Amy a lover of someone who was going to get that on the return trip? Or was Amy a passenger that maybe had a nickname Amy and actually wore that bracelet as they went up the grand staircase for dinner? A read of the passenger list revealed that there was an Amy on board. Miss Amy Elise Stanley, age 24. But who was she? No one knows who Amy was, but knowing that a human being had such an intimate connection to that bracelet really evokes great emotion. Whoever Amy was, she was dear to someone's heart. Each one of the thousands of artifacts surrounding the Titanic wreck had a story to tell. But many remained unknown. 
The tale behind one item in particular still baffles researchers. When the recovery crews in the North Atlantic were recovering artifacts on the bottom of the ocean, they came across a trunk. What should have been a simple identification became an unsolved riddle. The owner of the case was found to be a native of Buffalo, New York, named Howard Irwin. But Howard Irwin never sailed on the Titanic, at least under that name. Howard Irwin wasn't aboard the Titanic. There was no record on any manifest. But researchers found that at the very same time the Titanic set sail, Howard Irwin of Buffalo vanished, never to be seen again by family or friends. Was he a stowaway? Or was he hiding his identity? Was Howard Irwin a gambler traveling under assumed name to play as a card shark with the first class rich and famous? Or was Howard Irwin a man who disappeared somewhere in the world and they shipped his trunk back to America? Although Howard's true identity and fate remain a mystery, his love life is an open book for all to read. It's very interesting because in the bottom of that uh, case was a clarinet and a piccolo and also an incredible stack of love letters. One of the great letters as you read through this packet says, Dear Howie, you don't have to learn how to play the clarinet. I love you just the same. Were these lovers ever reunited? Or were the letters their last worldly exchange? The answer vanished that terrible night so long ago. It has been said that how can you give the most respect to those who gave their lives? And the answer always comes up. You can honor their memory and you can tell their tale. The Titanic too may someday be only a memory. After nearly a century, her time could be running out. There's a study of the microbes that are actually destroying and eating away the hull of the Titanic uh, as we speak that some people predict may be totally disintegrated within our lifetimes, maybe 15 or 20 years. So the race is on to bring as much of her story to the surface as possible. And the discoveries are a never-ending source of fascination. These casserole dishes were found in a tight pattern, as if toppling over after being stacked which turned out to be true. Over the years, the wooden crate that held them had rotted away. Still, not all of Titanic's treasures have been recovered. There have always been rumors of personal wealth aboard, cash, diamonds, stocks and bonds. But the most sought after prize, which would provide answers to many of Titanic's unsolved mysteries, is buried here, somewhere, waiting to be found. My holy grail would be to someday hopefully find the ship's logbook. I think this is the real treasure of the Titanic. Like an airplane's black box, the captain's log contains a record of every order and event which took place during the Titanic's voyage. This could give us a lot of information about what we all just speculate on now. Typically, Captain Smith would have recorded events till near the very end. Were they given orders about keeping the lights going? Were they told you must stay at your posts? We just don't know. It's still not clear what emergency actions Captain Smith tried after the Titanic's hull was torn open. But of all the controversies still swirling around the ship, the most heated is over a maneuver he didn't try. We've seen how begrudgingly the Titanic gives up her secrets. Prying them loose has taken millions of dollars, decades of time, and has put scores of divers, researchers, and scientists at serious risk. And yet many questions still go unanswered. The truth about one controversial mystery has been so elusive, we had to reconstruct the great ship herself to find it. One agonizing question will not go away before the last body had been recovered. Before the first inquest had been convened, the question was already being asked. In the final minutes of his life, had Captain Smith recklessly neglected a radical procedure which might have kept the doomed liner afloat long enough for rescue ships to arrive? 
a lot of hindsight speculation has kind of indicted Captain Smith, saying that uh, he should have left the watertight doors open so that the ship flooded progressively rather than concentrate all the water in the bow, causing her to plunge. Could that simple plan have worked? Could a reprieve have been granted to 1,500 lives? It seemed that the only way to solve that mystery was to reconstruct the Titanic. With the assistance of noted naval architect Arthur Sandiford, we made calculations for a precise representational model of Titanic to one to one hundredth scale. We realized that we were a little bit negatively buoyant there. Her size, weight and balance were all reduced proportionately, with the crucial watertight compartments that were thought to make her unsinkable, rebuilt here in transparent lucite. The massive tonnage of seawater that sent the ship to the bottom has also been reduced to exact scale. In our tank, we can sink the Titanic under many different conditions. First, we'll duplicate exactly how she went down in 1912. Water begins crashing into the forward cargo holds and boiler rooms five and six, just as it happened that night. Soon, seawater overruns Titanic's supposedly disaster-proof compartment system sinking the bow and sending her to the bottom in little over two hours. Our scale Titanic plunges on cue, just as she did back then. Now, we'll track the events as they might have occurred. If Captain Smith had opened all of the watertight doors, some experts maintain that Titanic would have stayed afloat two hours longer and Carpathia could have saved the 1,500 lives. During this experiment, we will track the progress of Carpathia, the loading of the lifeboats, and the flooding of Titanic. If Smith had opened the watertight doors back up, water would have surged into the after parts of the ship. Now this means that the ship wouldn't have taken that big plunge by the bow like she did. Step one, we flood Titanic precisely as she was flooded that night. The only difference is we've opened all of the watertight doors. This time we will go inside the Titanic to meet the floodwaters head on. Titanic strikes the iceberg at 11.40 p.m. At 11.50, water is pouring into the six watertight compartments opened by the iceberg. Water floods into the ship just as before, but in this experiment, it is free to flow the length of the ship. It's now 12.20 a.m. The first lifeboat is readied. Water is exploding into Titanic's hull at 350 tons a minute. But with the doors now open, the ship is sinking more evenly. Did Titanic's crew make a tragic mistake by ignoring this option? A lot of people were hoping that by leaving the watertight doors open, maybe the ship would have survived longer, long enough for the Carpathia to arrive on the scene and save everybody. 12.40 a.m. Carpathia has picked up the distress signal and begins to cover the 58 miles towards Titanic's position. Over 20,000 tons of water are pulling the Titanic lower, but she's still level. Suddenly, seawater engulfs the last boiler, killing power. Below decks, fleeing passengers stumble through coffin-like darkness. Chaos comes 90 minutes early to a desperate ship. It's 1.30, Carpathia is still 40 miles away. On the Titanic, 14 lifeboats are already away, but the hundreds left on deck now eye the six remaining boats and hope for the arrival of help. In our tank, the ship's bow remains above water, and she is much more level than in the real sinking. We'll help arrive in time. If so, it's proof that Captain Smith is guilty of the gravest oversight in maritime history. 1.40. Suddenly our model begins to roll over as the thousands of tons of water inside her shift. The remaining lifeboats cannot be launched at this angle. When water flows into a ship unchecked, the center of gravity goes up and she takes on a big list. By 1.45, the darkened Titanic is dangerously unstable, as the floodwaters, now out of control, slam her into a helpless list. 
Uh, heavy lists make it very difficult to launch lifeboats. So instead of the relatively calm sinking that we saw actually happen in 1912, we would have wound up with a ship in the dark for over an hour with a heavy list, panic, possibly stampedes on the lifeboats. It would have been a catastrophe. At 1.47, it happens. Our Titanic model rolls suddenly, capsizing with nearly 40,000 tons of water raging bow to stern. The model ship has sunk a full 33 minutes earlier than Titanic really did. And delays in loading lifeboats on a darkened ship surely would have cost valuable time, costing many more lives. The Carpathia is still more than 30 miles away. Help will be even longer in arriving for those in the water. If Smith had left the watertight doors open, contrary to his instructions, contrary to his training, the loss of life would have been catastrophic. It would not just been the Titanic, it would have been the Poseidon. History will forever condemn Captain Smith for the mistakes which doomed the Titanic. But partial vindication may lie at the bottom of our test tank. It is finally apparent that the Titanic's fate was sealed by the iceberg, and nothing within the captain's power could have saved his ship or the souls aboard her. There's never been a ship like the Titanic, famous in life, legendary in death. After nearly a century, there are hundreds of thousands of Titanic fans worldwide obsessed with buying the memorabilia, joining the clubs, and of course, making James Cameron's epic Titanic movie the biggest moneymaker of all time. As you've seen tonight, the Titanic is gradually parting with her secrets, but it will take many more harrowing dives to learn the whole truth, maybe enough to fill another century. But for now, you can see many of the precious Titanic artifacts in exhibits around the world, presented by RMS Titanic Incorporated, the company recovering them. They preserve the memory of those who died with dignity and respect. I'm Bernard Hill. Thanks for watching.